supposed to be a demo, but there's a bit of context and kind of a bee in my bonnet that I have that I want to do to give you an idea of what's going on. So this talk is basically going to be about this book here, which is a book on ethnomusicology. And to start with, I think even the phrase ethnomusicology is somewhat problematic, because why should we assume that some people's music has an ethnicity and other people's don't? So the bee that I have in my bonnet is actually around how Eurocentric a lot of the music analysis we do is. So last year I gave a, a talk here as well, and we were talking about doing music theory of tone and so on. And I, like you know, a lot of other people, is really attracted to classical Baroque European music and how easily systemizable that is. But that's not the whole world's music. So Professor Sim Ho Rong, who's the author of this book, um, is an excellent classical musician. I think he might have come first in his class for the French horn, or whatever, uh, in France. Um, and then after he graduated, a young idealistic man, he went to Africa for the first time. Uh, ideally, what he was going to do is he was going to effectively teach them how to do music, right? It's very nice of him to go there and help people learn about what music is, right? Because they obviously wouldn't know that themselves. Um, this was the day before the first anniversary of the Central African Republic's independence. So this was, you know, within a year of his country having effectively occupied his country, uh, and he was kind of... Uh, coming back to say, sorry about all that kind of occupation and stuff, here's some good music. Um, but he woke up the next morning and there was a celebration in the capital, Bangui. Um, I think it's on December 3rd or something like that. And basically he heard a whole bunch of music that just blew his socks off. He's a great musician. He only has a musical background in European music, but he really uh, has an open ear. Um, and he heard, for example, these are examples taken from the book, uh, wonderful percussion ensembles that had like interlocked rhythms in a way that he'd never heard before orchestras of like, 20 uh, woodwind instruments at once that were playing uh, this kind of odd piece of music where each musician was responsible for one pitch. Um, and also very complex contrapuntal choir music. So um, this changed the course of his life, basically. He stopped being a musician and ended up becoming a, a musicologist because he wanted to explore and understand the music of the Central African Republic. So I guess good on him. Um, this is one of those ensembles that uh, he mentioned, like the woodwind ones. Uh, so that's about 20 people uh, each with a horn that can play only one note. So it's actually quite complex from a musical point of view to play one of those musicians. Um, it wouldn't be something that a European musician could easily pick up and do right away. So in the book, uh, Aram doesn't just outline his theories about Central African music, he also talks about the theory of music structure itself. So this is another quote from him. Um, and in fact, the top bit where I've got realization, model realization, uh, that's actually directly including the arrows taken as well. So he's got the idea that you start with the actual phenomenon, the music, or I guess if you're thinking in terms of science, any kind of physical phenomenon, you model it, and then the test of your model is like we saw earlier with the generative grammars, well, it's that if you go backwards from the model, back out, you get something that sounds okay. If you don't get something that sounds okay or looks okay or uh, is accurate, then you know that your model's messed up in some way. So if the realizations on either side of the model have the same structural features, we'll have proof of the coherence of the system. And so in music terms, we often think that the model needs to be dots on a page. Now, I know everyone in this room might not all think that, but... Uh, I even heard today someone referring to what that is as music, which I actually somewhat theoretically disagree with. It's a form of notation. And it's very easy for those of us from the European tradition to equate the notation with the, the mathematical objects. Uh, so, yeah, they're not the same thing, and there's actually many different notations, as anyone who knows about music as code would know about. One of the tricky things is, of course, that to judge whether or not the performance you get from your representation is good enough is hard, because you need someone from within that tradition to judge whether or not the final music is okay. So, for example, I really enjoyed the, uh, you know, the couple of synthesis uh, pieces that were played earlier on today, but I guess to really judge whether the model is accurate, you would need someone who was already an expert in that music to judge and work out whether or not it was okay or not. So the fundamental theory that Aram has for Central African music is uh, he calls ostinato with variations. Now, I'd just like you to observe for a second, it's almost, to me, slightly problematic that we're using the phrase ostinato here. So that's an Italian term, uh, it's the cognate of the English word obstinate, and it basically means repetition. So you could say that this definition is re repetition with variation. 
Um, so why didn't he just say that? Well, because he's uh, explaining his music to an audience of people who are deeply ingrained with European metaphors for how music works. So one of the things that even though Arom is you know, a wonderful musician, uh, still alive today by the way, uh, he uh, is himself unable to escape his own background. And that's, that's something that we kind of all have to accept when we're doing this kind of work. So in the case of the horn orchestras, every horn plays a single pitch, and each musician has their own part. So they basically have this repetitive part that only lasts for a few seconds, and they have a structured series of ways that they can vary it. So the complexity of the music is somewhat horizontal rather than, uh, sorry, vertical rather than horizontal. So these musical pieces don't have obvious beginning, middle, end, like maybe kind of a, you know, a Beethoven suite would. Uh, so their, their complexity that they build up over time is combinatorial from every musician improvising within a strict framework. So I was wondering whether to use music as code, as I was uh, reading this book, wondering if putting things into music as code would actually provide kind of a nice way to help me understand what the hell was actually going on. And this is a message from a ROM in the book, so it almost felt like a, you know, a dedication to me somewhat. So it said, if the reader himself, or herself I hope, um, wishes to use the transcriptions to construct polyrhythmic formulae, Assuming they respect the rules of the grammar, they may do so. Well, I guess I've got permission to do so. Um, and my combinations should be perfectly acceptable to the bearers of the vision. Now that's a somewhat bigger claim, I guess, because it's saying that the model that Rom's come up with is accurate, but I guess, um, hopefully, he would know. Um, cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive into the music itself now. Um, and try to use a Lisp, in this case, to explain some of the music. And I'm going to, in the end, kind of conclude with an argument as to why music as code goes some way towards thinking about the Eurocentricity of music theory, but not the whole way. So I've got a few different um, kind of helper functions here that express a ROM's theoretical framework, um, and quite a few less lines than he does, right? Because obviously it's a programming language, so we can be much more precise about this kind of thing. So this rand variations is how we capture his idea about variations over time. So if we have a list of variations, as an argument, um, then what we do is we choose a random variation, which is just uh, closure is not pure, so you can get side effects, so you can have random choice. Um, then we concatenate that variation with a lazy sequence of random variations of the rest. Um, but of course the rest we need to shift in time, because we don't want to play all the variations ever on top of each other. We want to play, choose another, choose another, choose another. And to actually generate a part, well, what we do is we take a bunch of variation functions, because it turns out it's actually quite a lot easier to represent a variation not as the notes itself, but as what you do to change one set of notes to another set of notes, um, and uh, apply that to an underlying model. So this is the code we're going to use, and you don't have to believe me that it works, because I'm going to play it and use it, you can um, hear it for yourself. So the first piece I'm going to have a look at uh, described in the book is called something that is very vaguely like Agatharuma. Now, I have not lived in the Central African Republic, I don't speak any of the language from there, so if anyone does, I'm sorry. Um, if anyone doesn't, I'm doing it perfectly. <laughs> uh, so the child drum, so the, this drum piece, like a, a, a Rom said, is the interlocking rhythm. The drum has an underlying model, which is described by this rhythm. Um, and my techniques for coming up with rhythms and notes are very similar to ones you've already seen today. So, you know, that, that basic pattern of having a MIDI-like representation where you have pitch and time, that's what I'm using as well. So a rhythm, uh, as Haley pointed out earlier, can be represented as a list of durations. So that's what's happening here. Um, now, the interesting part that is uh, special to this musical tradition is how we structure the variations. Because it's not just that you can do any kind of variation, because if you, if you improvise in like a lawless way, you're going to stomp all over the space that the other musicians are expecting to use. So you kind of have to do it as a musician. You have to be creative, but within constraints. So this underlying model, which is the simplest version of the part, has A, B, C, and D variations. And they're represented by basically taking the simpler notes and splitting them, um, or occasionally skipping them. So uh, each of these variations is actually a function in itself, which is why when I get to... Uh, uh, D, for example, I can compose together a skip and another skip. Uh, so it just makes it easy. It's a melody function of melody to melody. So as I'm varying it, I can just plug them together. So the overall part, the child, takes the underlying model and then randomly applies these different variations to it. Now, 
I'm randomly doing it. I'm sure the musicians of the tradition would not randomly do it. They're going to have reason. They're going to be reacting to each other. So this is going to be somewhat lifeless reproduction. But as I'm pretty sure not many people here are experts in the tradition, I can probably get away with it. Uh, this piece has a mother drum. Is as much Sorry, the same. Oh, yeah? What are your ratios in the split, for example? Oh, yeah. Um, so the split is that you don't want to... Uh, one is the location of when in the melody the note is, so it's a targeting. I need to actually, like... Um, the, uh, the T is like where the first argument is which one note I'm targeting. The second one is how lopsided the split should be. So you don't always split it in half. You might split the whole note into a third and two thirds. Good question. Thank you. Um, so splits and skips turn out to be enough to represent these things. So you've got the three drums, the child, the mother, and the father. Um, interestingly enough, one of the challenges that Rom had was working out how to get to this simplest version. Because if you just hear people performing it, you're not hearing the platonic reality, you're hearing kind of the shadows in the cave, you're hearing the various improvisations, so how do you get back to the simple? Well, he basically just messed around with it ages until he had a point he was happy with. Um, and he was uh, explaining this to one of the bearers of the tradition, uh, and they, they, uh, they were somewhat puzzled as to why he would be trying to play like a crap version of it, like why are you trying to simplify it down? Um, and when he finally explained, uh, they were like, oh, yeah, that sounds, that's, what, that's what we teach the kids when they're starting out. Yeah, yeah, so we do have to, yeah. Um, so basically, had he asked the people who were the musicians of this particular group what the kind of the training version of it was, um, he would have been able to be just told straight away and save himself all this reverse engineering work. Um, which shows you if you're actually examining cultural phenomena, just asking is a valid strategy. Um, because he did spend a whole lot of time just doing data analysis and trying to figure it out himself. Um, but I guess that's the, the danger if you're... Um, coming into someone else's culture and trying to like reverse engineer it. So here's Aga Turuma, right? um, and the drums will get introduced, I think, one after another. You hear the second drum come in, there's a third drum. So this doesn't have a beginning, middle and end. The way I'm playing it now will be slightly different probably to all the other times I've played it because of the different combinatorial overlap. So sometimes they'll be repeated bars, but often they'll be like subtly different. So if you listen to like one part, say the highest part, you kind of hear that it's got the same moral repetition, but just doing slightly different things. So that's one of the pieces. And by the way, it's using fives slash tens rather than threes or fours. So I'm seeing nodding, which is probably from people in the audience, who probably means people who are uh, quite decent musicians are figuring that out. Um, but that's yet another way that this is slightly alienating music and you have to reverse engineer it. So it's not unheard of to have fives in your, uh, in your music, obviously, in Western music, but it's not the default. Um, so I've only talked about percussion so far, so I'm also going to talk about scales a little bit because this is something where the way I represent it differs a little bit from other ones you've heard today. So you could represent a scale as a set. Uh, I prefer to represent a scale as a function, from rank to a note in the scale, um, mostly because it makes transformations on that <coughs> really natural. Um, so the major scale starts with this set of intervals, double jump, double jump, single jump, double, double, single, um, and then converts it into a function that tells you for any rank you give it what the actual note should be. So the pentatonic scale, for example, has two jumps, a triple jump, double, double, triple, and then repeats over and over. Uh, so the Central African scale, uh, or the scale used for most Central African music, we can then represent as a function of composition of a couple of concepts. So it's like a pentatonic scale. Um, this particular one is an asymmetric pentatonic scale, where there are apparently, and I'm not sure that I believe this or not, because it must sound really challenging, because it has no fifths in it. Apparently there's a five-tone equal temperament scale, um, which could be represented very easily using kind of the lattice approach earlier on. Um, but the bit that I think is really interesting is this single character here. You see like the minus? So because, oh cool, um, because we're able to uh, uh, represent things as functional compositions, what we do by negating is we're just flipping the scale around. And that's because in this musical tradition, the ordering of the notes is the reverse to what is in Europe. In Europe, we start with low and we ascend, right? So we start with low notes to high notes. In Central African Republic, they start with small notes and go to big notes. Because the small note is the one that, like with Pythagoras, you get by hitting a small bit of metal, right? And then you get bigger, bigger, bigger. So really, if you're going to naturally represent a scale in the Central African Republic, you need to start high. Um, so I won't do A major, I'll just do pentatonic. Good. 
Cool. Oh, actually, no, probably what I should have done is the central applicant. So that's the natural scale. So I'm going to play a pitched tune now. It follows the same fundamental theory, like I said before. So we represent an underlying model. This time it's a phrase. So it has both pitches and durations. I won't spend too much time on it, but I think you re reverse engineered the code, you'd understand. Um, we've got a bunch of variations. Sometimes the variations are compositions of other variations. That's nice, because that gives even more structure. Um, and so this particular one has five basic parts, because it's a pentatonic scale, and every uh, note in the scale has its own part. So I'm going to play, just to start with, just one uh, whistle <coughs> on its own. This is what one musician's playing, right? So they're obviously having hit their rhythm and they're doing various things with it. So what happens is there's actually a whole bunch of other musicians. So there's uh, musicians on each of the notes and then actually in different octaves. That's how you get to the 18. So it's still the five note scale and there's still the same part, but you're doubling them up. So uh, in con consistency with that model of music, I'm calling these the big version of the tete. The big, big version of Tete and big, 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 right? <laughs> um, because if I was saying it was the higher or the lower versions, that wouldn't really be consistent with this particular model. So here's what, um, here's what it sounds like all up. I think we might be missing one of the uh, speakers, actually. Oh, no? oh it's here, maybe it's just <coughs> It's like repetitive because this is this is textured music. This is how it works, not just original. Cool. Just about to finish it. All right. So that's the, the kind of other demo. So I'm just going to quickly um, segue to kind of uh, the conclusion. So uh, I'm making the argument that uh, we can create less culturally biased forms of music, but mostly by separating notation and representation. So we've got the bit where we actually come up with the musical concepts, the computation bit. We've got a simple format like MIDI. And the separation of those two, whereas Western music notation doesn't separate the human interface and the representation, actually lets us uh, create lots of different notations. So we don't have to come up with one universal notation and stick with it forever. We can come up with new notations for new concepts and compile them down to the same underlying data format. So that lets us have sophisticated mechanisms for abstraction and composition which means we can have open world languages and accept other traditions um, with mutual intelligibility because we boil it down to the same format. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, we are a little bit behind schedule, so we only have time for a couple of short questions. Anybody? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's more of a comment. You mentioned about the yeah. about the fact that a five tone equal tone yeah. would not have fits. Yeah. That's less of a problem if using cussive instruments. True. Yeah. Because the uh, overtones are not perfect multiples anyway, and apparent and like, there is theory about how that fits in the other Cool. Really interesting. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the extremely refreshing talk. And uh, in most Western tradition, people sort of compose music in a centralized way. So we can yeah. have one composer sitting in a room sure, block yeah. to write a score. And I know in some traditions, uh, there are a group of musicians uh, sitting together and they sort of improvise yeah. and they communicate through music. So do you see any, uh, or are you aware of other people trying to uh, model this sort of uh, distributed music composition? Uh, it's interesting. I know there's something called the laptop orchestra that people do with synthesis together. I think it's a different, difficult problem because it's basically, as you point out, a distributed systems problem. And in particular with the music synthesis we have, getting timing exactly right is really hard. Uh, so I think many people have tried, but I don't think genuinely in the actual computer synthesis world people have done it so well. Obviously improvisational groups do it all the time and they have like hand signals or ways of converging on the time, or maybe they get out and the drummer slows everyone down. There's all these distributed system mechanisms that musicians use, but I don't know in the synthesis world of people making that kind of collaboration really work. Well. But it's a really cool concept. I just, <coughs> just um, um, I've been in Western Cosmos, yep. well, uh, Olivia Messiaen has kind of yep. renowned for these really complex rhythms. I think, yep. I believe, I'm doing the investigation of world music. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if maybe your approach would also be interested to the red-bated method of composition and maybe 
it would allow you to make explicit your influences. So, that, like, so you would be able, so for example, one of the things I cut out to have a shorter talk was uh, going, talking about Steve Reich's clapping music, which is very similar to the passive thing. So, if you're able to represent them in a common way, you should be able to describe the relationship. Because I think there's actually a real danger of exploitation in those, uh, or appropriation in those things, like Bartok, similarly, with Hungarian folk music, where it's very easy to kind of take people's folk music pass it off as your own and not really give credit back, so maybe that can be useful there. Good. Good. Thank right. you. Thanks very much.